Hey everybody, it's Robin with Creativity RV and this is where I woke up today. I'm at a good overnight spot. I've stayed at about three other times between Copper Mountain and Frisco, Colorado on I-70. Um, I realized a lot of truckers stayed here, so I think this is my third time staying here, but there's this little water area behind me. I won't call it a lake because it's not big enough to be a lake, but look at this view. I don't know if you guys can actually see all the white capped mountains behind me. I'll try and get you a better shot. But you can see that I'm here with a lot of semis and um, it's great here and I'm about to get back on the road and get somewhere a little bit warmer so that I can do your view cue. Hey everybody, it's Robin with Creativity RV and welcome to another Sunday morning view queue where I pick all the best viewer questions and comments from the last view queue that was two weeks ago and I'm going to answer them all for you today. Today I'm going to be answering questions about all things hygiene, the cat litter box, leveling jacks, composting toilet, food storage, and more. I hope that it's not too noisy right here because I'm actually in a really pretty rest area and then semis pulled up on both sides of me and they're both running their generators. So I shut the windows um, and I hope you guys can hear me okay. But let's get right to the questions because we have a bunch of good ones, including a couple on hygiene that I'll put at the end because I'm going to answer them together. But let me get right to it. Okay, Jan Hoyle said, question, stupid question. There are no stupid questions. Where do you keep big boys litter pan? Okay, so I've shown this to you guys before, but I'm gonna show you another shot right now. I keep his litter box up in the passenger foot area because I don't have a passenger with me usually, but in order for this to work, I actually had to get a top entry litter box. Those regular litter boxes that are super wide, would not work. The top entry is great. It's actually huge and deep. My boy is 12 years old and he had no problem at all acclimating to the top entry litter box. And actually it's kind of cool because it traps the litter and stops it from getting back out. I keep it up there all the time unless I have a passenger and then I move it to the back. By the way, as always, anything that I mentioned that I use that I bought at Amazon, you can find through the one link I have at the bottom that shows you all of my Amazon recommendations and that is under pet gear if you go to that link. Okay, the next question is from Urban Without Grace. I love some of your YouTube names. Um, I get this one a lot. Are you going to add another composting toilet to the new RV? Also, what is the name of the water you use for face washing? Well, I'll tell you the face washing thing in a minute when I go through the hygiene. So as you guys know, I had a composting toilet in my last RV, which went with that RV when I traded it in for this one. I have some videos on installation hacks and also I learned how to evaporate my gray water since, you know, there was no black water being mixed into that tube and I was really getting good at that. But then when I had all those problems with my repairs, I didn't actually mention this in the repair video because I just don't want to sound like I'm complaining too much. I asked them to install an exhaust vent. It wasn't actually necessary. I'm sorry that I asked them to do it because when I got it back, not only had they drilled that hole in the side of my RV to put that hose in, but the Yahoo's at that dealership actually put like an L bracket on my composting toilet. I think they couldn't figure out how to reinstall it after they took it out and they bolted it to the ground. So when I finally figured that out and I went to lift it up, it took the entire base with it. And also I couldn't even empty it without totally taking out that tube, which they had glued into the wall. I swear I had like composting toilet PTSD after all the stuff I went through with that dealership and that toilet. So for now, I am not going to be installing a new composting toilet. If I had to do it again in the future, I would do it. I would do it absolutely in like a van or a tiny house or another rig that doesn't have a lot of water. But my friend Carol, who you may have seen in an interview I did of her rig, she had a, a sea head composting toilet. It was a lot easier to empty, but I like them. Uh, just right now, it's not something I want to deal with, but I get that question a lot, so I thought I'd answer it. Moving on. Karen says, with regards to your book, you mentioned we or us. Who else is working with you? I have a great friend named Jill, who I actually interviewed at one point on my blog, and um, if you go over to my blog, you can see her interview there, but 
she is amazing and she has her own marketing company consulting gig that she does out of a van and when I had a very limited amount of time to get a quality product out in that book and my regular book editor was booked I reached out to Jill and she helped me format the whole book with all of those links and she has been working with me on an ongoing basis because like I mentioned in the last video queue we update the links and there's hundreds of them in that book every week and then we update the content in the book every quarter as needed we're working on it right now and we've got a lot of great stuff a lot of job resources and stuff like that is going into the book i love jill i couldn't do it without her she didn't write the book but when i say we she helps me format it and update it as needed and she's been great so priola 71 said Happy Easter, you too. I'd love to hear whether you have done anything to create a great workspace on the road. How do you take it outside? Not to be thick about it, I'm just such a cubicle gopher. <laughs> I love it. Um, which I absolutely cannot stand anymore. Heard, I hear you. Um, and I'm thinking about living as a nomad. I actually did a little video on my rad outdoor office setup. Um, it was like almost a year ago though, I think. So I do have a pop-up like camping table, like a regular camping table that the legs swing out that I use outside. Um, I try and go in a shady area and the best tip I can give you is to get a cell antenna like I do. I have another video on that. I put it on a painter's pole and then I put it up in the air and um, it gives me a great signal. And then on your display, you can put like a towel around the top of your computer just so, you know, there's like a little edge around it or a book or a file folder or something like that to block the glare and then go into your settings and turn the display up as bright as it'll go and you'll be able to work outside. I hope that helps. Sandy Wells said, spring, finally! Living in Cheyenne and wondering if you have any recommendations for good BLM area in Colorado that would be a good choice for a schoolie. Congrats on having a schoolie and hitting the road. It'll be my first time out and I'm trying to decide on a destination that isn't really far from home. My bus is 35 feet. Yes, I have a bunch of BLM suggestions in Colorado, but I would say two things. First, if you go to Leadville, Colorado, which is my absolute favorite, right when you're on your way to Turquoise Lake, there's literally, well, it's National Forest Dispersed Camping there, but there are turnoffs everywhere. And if you look at my five camping options within five miles video, I show you that. But I did another video called Spaceship Sirens and Spiders. I think if you saw that one, that was up near Pagosa Springs, Colorado by Buena Vista and Salida. I would recommend that one for you because the road up is pretty easy. It gets a little bumpy near the end, but then there are tons of campsites, really big turnaround campsites, and the star viewing is amazing. That's where we saw the space station flying by. And if you do go there, girl, you have to go to the Salida Aquatic Center. For $12, you can get a private hot spring room. It's like a spa room where you go down these steps into your private hot spring that you fill up yourself with water for $12 for the hour and it has a shower in it and it is divine and in I think it's Pagosa Springs right by there you have to go to the Pancake Palace it is unreal my friends and I went there and then we actually went back again even though it was in the opposite direction of our travels because we loved it that much the Roland Rue says, where did you get those beautiful couch pillows? I love them you know what I get this question a lot here they are um, Walmart. Walmart. I think they were $10 a piece. Penny Atherton says, do you have leveling jacks? And if so, are they auto and how do you like them? I have another semi-neighbor, you guys. I apologize. I'm sure you can hear that. So, I'm a little torn about leveling jacks, to be honest. I had them on my leisure travel van. I had the dealership install them. They're expensive. They do make your life easier because when you stop, you can be in a pretty uneven space and you don't need to drive up onto blocks and come back down. And as a solo person where I don't have someone outside to go, go back two inches or put the blocks in front of the wheel, I felt like it was a good investment for me. And it was, I had Bigfoot leveling jacks, but along with the other problems I had, those jacks take hydraulic fluid for the jacks to go up and down. And they take hoses to get that fluid to the jacks 
and I had all four of my hoses burst two different times and they all had to be replaced. I think it might have been the way that the dealership from whom I purchased the RV installed them. Maybe they were twisted or something. The people at Bigfoot were great, um, but the problem is that the alarm kept going off saying there was a problem as I was going down the road and there was some danger they could come down while I was moving or not go back up when I wanted to leave. So I was actually kind of happy to get rid of those. I would consider them again, but my new rig doesn't allow that kind of weight. And if I ever want to tow anything and I put those jacks on, I might not be able to safely tow anything. And also a consideration is sometimes if you put them on, if you have a warranty on your chassis, it can void your warranty. They're nice to have. I'm not going to lie to you. They make life a lot easier, but it's another thing that you have to maintain. They're expensive and they will reduce your tow capacity or what kind of weight you can carry on your rig. So just think about all that when you make your decision. Living the RV local life says, love the benchmark map thing. Oh, and by the way, I just was using my benchmark map, if you guys don't have one of these, um, because I'm headed out of Colorado and I needed to find some BLM side roads that were not taken up by everybody else. So that is a good thing. Glad you like it. Um, can you tell me how you went about buying your new RV? Did you negotiate the price and how did you do it? Well, dirty little secret. I love to negotiate. Uh, I, I like it. I'm good at it. And, um, you know, I did have a trade in this last time with my leisure travel van. I mean, frankly, my leisure travel van just pooped the bed on me with a composting toilet and everything else. And I needed to trade it in for something else. Someday I'm going to build my own rig where everything in here was built out by me. So if there's a problem, I don't have anyone to blame, but I throw the most low ball price of them and don't worry about if they're going to get offended. They're going to seem like they're so offended, but everybody who comes to buy an RV takes 30% off. That seems to be the rule of thumb. You really have to go into some used RV websites like RV Trader and see what the rigs are going for when they're used or new. So you know what kind of a ballpark you want to be in. And also go online and look up NADA.com, I think it is. It's like the blue book for RVs, so you can see what a good range is. But I'll tell you, the best thing I ever did was when I bought my leisure travel van, I knew what I wanted. I had never, like you guys know, been in an RV, but I had seen a bunch of videos, and I knew that it was the floor plan I wanted, I thought, rookie move. But what I did is I actually built out the rig myself on the leisure travel van website. I took off the 30%. And I knew it wasn't going to fly because for supply and demand, those don't lose their value as much. But then I sent an email with my offer in writing to the 13 dealerships that carried them in the United States. Most people didn't even get back to me. One guy actually told me to F off in writing on an email, which just blew my mind. Not a smart move, dude. But I then had one guy that wrote me back a very curt email, no, thank you, no, maybe we can negotiate. He just said, we are a for-profit business, so I reject your offer. And I wrote him back and I said, well, of course I want you to make a profit. What range are you thinking of? He gave me a number, we went back and forth, and we came up with a sales price in between. And I did get my first unit for about probably fifteen or twenty thousand dollars less than I would have gotten it otherwise and so I waited until I got that kind of a deal I hope that helps it can be really nerve-wracking you know you buy an RV and then you find out somebody got the exact same thing for five thousand dollars less it's frustrating but I'll also say this really carefully read the MSRP you might look at one unit and then buy a different unit and you think everything's gonna be on there the MSRP will tell you if it has leveling or stabilizing jacks if it's got you know tire sensors what kind of generator it has all of that stuff so be careful when you're going in to negotiate that you have all that information really quick i want to give a shout out again to my viewer mike mead mike mike listen to me now you have to start a channel this guy has the best information and he actually put a link that i will copy below for you guys 
on the last view queue saying that Nevada State Parks has an annual pass also like New Mexico does, and I did not know that. So thanks, Mike. That was a really good tip for everybody, so I'm going to share it with everybody down below. Start a channel, Mike. Now I want to address a question I got that I can't find now in the comments. There are so many comments, but a lady said, why do you just sit on your couch and do videos and you know why don't you show us more of your travels well honestly you guys this year i'm thinking of doing more travel videos um you know when i set out to do this channel what i wanted to do was show people information that i found that i hadn't found in other youtube videos that's really what i wanted to do i think you can see other people travel but you know i am doing more travels and if you guys want me to show them do tell me down below, and if you want me to, I'll show you more. But sometimes I'll do a string of these, you know, more educational type videos because I'm in one place and I don't want to divulge what my location is until after I leave. And, you know, it's just a personal preference safety thing. So know that if I show you guys where I have been traveling, I'll be long gone by the time I post it. And now let's get to the hygiene questions. And I'll say this also, if you guys want me to actually show you, well, I'm not gonna show you everything, but if you want me to show you my hygiene routine in a whole video, I will show you. But I get questions like this a lot. So Sherry says, your hair always looks great. Thanks, I just got it cut professionally and I don't like it as much as when I cut it myself, but I'm getting used to it. Um, I wonder about personal hygiene when boondogging, not to get too personal, but, I also wonder about food and food preparation. What do you eat and how do you prepare? And um, by the way, I'm obsessed with food preparation and actually food storage in the RV. So I'm doing a whole year thing on that and look out because soon I'll be telling you guys some of the tips that I've been learning. And you know, somebody else asked me earlier in the view queue, what was the stuff I used to wash my face? So this is what I wanted to tell you guys. I use micellar water. I've told you guys about this before, but I love it. I don't know any other van person or RV person that has mentioned this or uses it, but I use, you know, just the regular Walgreens. You can get this at the grocery store, Garnier, um, micellar water. So if you guys don't know what micellar water is, basically there's a molecular structure inside of the water that attaches to dirt. So not only am I not using the water in my tanks to wash my face, I'm actually using a solution here that attracts dirt. You're supposed to use it with like a cotton swab because you can't just splash this on your face, then the dirt has nowhere to go. I actually use it with washcloths and I use it on my face every morning and every night. It doesn't dry me out, but you have to get the non-oily kind that you don't have to rinse off. I've heard it could be irritating for some people. It's not for me, but I use it every morning and every night on my face. And like I say in the book, I use it on the pits, nibbles and bits. Um, if I'm not going to be showering that day, I do use micellar water and a washcloth for hygiene, and I wash my hair about every three days, and I'll answer that in the next gal's question. I also just started using this Body Wipe by Shower Pill. Now, I know there's a lot of other ones on the market. I've tried them. I don't love them. This one I actually like so far, and I'll put the link for this in my Amazon recommendations as well, but this is for athletes, and it doesn't get sticky. So it's got like witch hazel and some other stuff in it, and it's a big washcloth, and you know, if I wanna do like a full body thing, then I use that and it doesn't get all sticky. When you live in a house and you're so used to taking these big, long, hot showers every day, you think that you need that. And I just found that I didn't need it. I didn't wanna waste my water on it. I didn't wanna to have to empty my tanks more often. And you know, like I say in the book, I actually included a bunch of research on what's really healthy. Uh, for how often to wash your hair and your skin and and um, oh I have to tell you guys I can't even bend over in that shower to shave my legs you know like most RV showers it's smaller so I got a rechargeable dry shaver and I actually got the men's kind because I find that women's shavers are wimpy burger so um, I'll put that in the links also but um, then I'll sit outside my camp chair you know and shave my legs so I don't have to do it in the shower which works great and then I got this really great comment from AB. She said, Robin, please do a video on older women in RVs. I'm going to be in my 50s and 60s and my husband wants to retire in an RV. I'm so worried about air conditioning. I live in the deep south, so obviously I need air conditioning all the time, 
but I don't like to sleep when I'm hot. I can't imagine traveling without it. We will be boondocking mostly as we can't afford a campground every night. Uh, so I would imagine I wouldn't have AC. How do you keep cool when you're sleeping? How do you get enough water to shower? I have long thick hair that requires a blow dryer to straighten it. Are the batteries in an RV strong enough to use a blow dryer? It takes me about 45 minutes to an hour to dry my hair. I would imagine I would short circuit the whole RV. My husband runs every day and he's going to want a good shower. Try this. Then for him, this is really good for that if he's a runner. Help. Will I get used to not showering? Okay, let me go through them one by one. My first question would be, are you going to be boondocking in the South where it's really hot? If you go to Google and you search chasing 70 degrees, I think there's a YouTube channel with that name, but there was a guy that actually mapped out the United States and showed where you were most likely to find 70 degree weather at any time. And it actually shows it going across the United States. Most people travel into cooler weather. So personally, what I look for is like 40s and 50s at night, 60s, 70s during the day. I don't like to be even in 80s, I get too hot. You have to trap the cool air in in the morning if you're in a hot climate. And you can do that with window shades and reflectix. But then at night, as soon as the sun goes down, open up all your windows, run your ceiling fan or run a fan, wash out the inside of your RV with cool air, and one thing that I found was really important for me, and you can see I'm like looking at my bedroom, is that you have a cross breeze over your bed. I have windows on both sides and it's divine. I never have to use air conditioning. Now, if you do want your air, if you have a hookup, you can run your AC. If you run your generator, you can usually run AC, but most people do not have the battery or solar to run AC without a generator or a hookup. I know Bob Wells has done a video on somebody that had a big enough setup to do it, but it will really drain your power. So I would say, you know, try to go to places where you don't need air conditioning at night. And I know what you mean, because I hate to be hot. Let me address the rest of your email. So if you guys watch my very first videos, I had long, dark, curly hair. I too would blow dry it for 45 minutes or an hour when I lived in a house to get the curls out and it was just such a hassle and I tried to do it when I got in the RV and it was too much power. Most people have to run a generator to run their blow dryer. If you have a lower wattage blow dryer and you have a strong enough inverter and good enough batteries and solar, then you don't have to do that. But most people don't. Most people have to run their generator to blow dry their hair. Actually, I just turned off the camera to run and get this for you guys, ladies, men, whatever. This has been a game changer for me with the hair. This is called Kenra Dry Texture Spray. And I'll put the link for this also in my Amazon recommendations. Now, you guys may know dry shampoo, you know, where you spray that white stuff in your roots and then you shake it around and it like takes the dirt out or the grease out. That stuff leaves this weird white residue and it like dries out your ends and it's awful. But then I found this dry texture spray. I get it in a two pack on Amazon and it's like a styling spray that does the same thing as dry shampoo. So I'm actually going to do it. So, I mean, you can see my hair will just stick straight up on it. I can't believe I'm doing this on camera. But then I'm looking in the camera because I can't really see. I'm trying to figure out which way to do this. But I mean, you know, all you can do is uh, you just style it. And it doesn't put a bunch of product in your hair, and it doesn't make it dirty or greasy, and it actually, like dry shampoo, makes it feel lighter, because this stuff is the best stuff for road warriors ever. And I mean, like, for men and women. It's great. Back to our regularly scheduled program. I tried to let my long, naturally curly hair dry naturally. I tried to see what it would look like, and... I gave it up because I just had like pieces of hair stuck to the walls everywhere. Ladies who have long hair, you know what I'm talking about. It gets everywhere. Now the guys out there may not do this, but you know, we wet our hair and we wash our hair and we rinse it out and we put in the conditioner and we rinse that out. That takes a lot of water. I just use shampoo and then I spray leave-in conditioner in. Even on my long hair, I did that. It works great. So, you know, there are some things that you have to give up 
to live this kind of a life, but you don't have to give up everything. You figure out how to camp like you. And if you want your long hair and you want it to be blown out, run your generator. You know, if you need a lot of water in order to keep your hair up, you might want to use a campground shower every once in a while or a rest area bathroom where you can blow dry your hair if you're not too embarrassed to do it in front of everybody else. For me, I found that I wanted to go shorter and shorter and then I didn't want to dye it and um, I love it and it works for me but it may not work for you but listen there's a solution for everything you want to do on the road you just have to get out there and do it and figure out what works for you and then make adjustments that's all that's it you guys I hope you enjoyed this Sunday's view cue if you have a viewer question or a comment on anything or you want to give advice to anybody else that's put comments below please do just scroll down past all the recommended videos to the comment section I love doing the view cue because I feel like we're all just talking and I can't believe how lucky I am that I have all these friends out there that I've never been able to meet, but someday I hope I can. Until then, everybody out there have happy travels and be free.